Uh, all right, everyone, uh, thanks again uh, for bearing with us. Uh, my name is Matt Atkinson. I am a Global Project Director here at the newly rebranded Reuters Events Pharma, uh, formerly IFA Pharma, uh, and a warm welcome again to today's webinar, The Roadmap to Virtual Engagement in Clinical Trials, uh, where connected technology can improve enrollment and retention for a seamless patient experience. Uh, before we launch into everything, a, a small bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will be sending the recording and slides uh, around to everyone uh, in the coming week. So please keep your eye out for that if you are after them. Uh, and secondly, this is a live, uh, live webinar uh, with Q&A to our panelists. Uh, please keep the questions coming in throughout. Uh, we will get to as many of them as I can uh, to our panelists. And uh, so we've had over 1,300 people register today uh, for what is a pretty important topic as we continue to navigate our way through COVID-19 and plan for what a post-lockdown future might be. Uh, why is this important? Well, uh, if we look at the clinical trial model currently, I think most would agree that it's not necessarily patient-centric. The journey from recruitment to enrollment and through to completion is, is both arduous uh, and time consuming. Uh, and that's just for pharma. 30% uh, of patients would rather drop out than stay enrolled uh, and enforces a decline in R&D returns and prevents medicines getting to the patients that need them the most. Uh, the mission then is clear. We need to revolutionize uh, all of this for a better patient experience. Uh, we're now equipped with an array of digital technology and data sources. How we connect them all to drive new efficiencies and re increase retention is the challenge. In today's webinar, we're going to tackle those key topics. Uh, so listen throughout and we'll hear how we can reduce the complexity of recruitment and enrollment to engage patients whenever and wherever they prefer to instill greater confidence and compatibility with trial operations and protocol. Uh, connect investigators and patients, so use telehealth, easy to use apps and mobile technology to eliminate the burden of site travel to create patient preferred trials. We're also gonna to touch on how to leverage data and analytics. Um, and these are the lovely faces of our panelists today. Uh, first off, we have Celine Ullman, who is the head of R&D Digital at Almorel, Jacob Laporte, who is the co-founder and head of Novartis Biome, Brian Neiman, CEO and co-founder of Sanguine Biosciences, and Jennifer Turcott, who is the life sciences lead from Salesforce. Uh, and Salesforce is our partner in this webinar. And so we thank them for that. And here we go now to all our faces. Thank you all. Um, I would just ask if you could give a brief introduction of yourselves uh, and what, uh, what you're here for, why you think this topic is important. Uh, and Jacob, uh, you're on the top left-hand corner, so I'll come to you first. And then if we, uh, no, that's great. All right. Well, it's great to be here, Matt. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks for everyone attending. Um, as Matt mentioned, I'm the global head of the Novartis Biome. Uh, our simplest metaphor is we act as a bridge between the external digital health ecosystem and internal business teams trying to solve unique, solution, uh, unique problems with digital solutions. Um, I also used to lead uh, digital for our global drug development organization. And so I'm quite passionate about this topic of bringing new uh, paradigms to clinical trials to make them faster, more efficient, and more importantly, better experiences for patients. Um, so we can get medicines, much, much needed medicines to patients faster. So, so thanks a lot and looking forward to the discussion. Jean, if Jennifer, please. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Turcott from Salesforce. I'm part of our healthcare and life sciences strategy team. Our team really works across the industry and with our customers to ensure we're building products that meet the needs of where the industry is headed. Super pleased to be here today and excited uh, to participate on this panel. Uh, Celine, thank you. 
Sure, I'm Celine Allman. I'm the head of R&D Digital for Almoral, a dermatology company based out of Barcelona. Uh, and I have similar background to Jacob. I come from uh, Novartis R&D, where I was uh, leading a couple of DTX development projects. Um, so I guess my, my expertise in digital therapeutics will be relevant for the topic today. Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Brian Neiman, a co-founder and CEO of Sanguine. And uh, uh, what we're doing uh, at the company is helping uh, patients, uh, helping empower patients to accelerate research for their condition. And what that means is uh, making it easier for them to participate from home through home visits by nurses and phlebotomists and through online uh, enrollment and consenting and uh, data participation. And uh, we've completed uh, over 600 studies to date uh, with over 30,000 patients. And uh, uh, happy to be here and speak about how Salesforce has helped us uh, as a fantastic partner throughout that process. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. And thank you, everyone. We are now going to have a uh, presentation from Jennifer. And I shall hand it back over to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. I know these are challenging times and you have a lot going on with your business. In today's session, we're going to discuss perspectives on virtual clinical trials uh, and in particular patient engagement. Next slide. Every individual, community and business around the world has been really impacted by COVID. We wanna thank you for everything that you do to help patients. So moving on. I think everyone is probably familiar with the challenges that we're seeing today in clinical trials. There's low patient recruitment, which is one of the biggest challenges that sponsors, CROs, and sites must overcome. Phase one through phase three trials are on average 30% longer than planned due to patient recruitment issues and low patient retention. There are a multitude of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, patients and physicians lack awareness of most clinical trials, and there's still a ton of sociocultural issues related to participation. There's also a fear and lack of information which get in the way of success. Part of this is a result of a lack of physician and patient education, and then really just a patient's fear of being a guinea pig or receiving a placebo when they really are looking for a, a therapy or um, treatment. Lastly, I think we're really seeing with the new advent of specialized therapies, probably the largest barrier is related to complexity of clinical protocols and the inclusion and exclusion criteria. As a result, Finding the right patient for the right drug in the right trial takes a very long time. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. We recognize, though, increasing enrollment and retention rates is paramount for the future of clinical trials and for healthcare advancements. We have to find a way to improve our current approach as it's not sustainable. Next slide, Mark. Thanks. One thing we know is that pharma leaders are under tremendous pressure to explore decentralized trials. And many are using new technology approaches to provide differentiated virtual support and engagement for those participants in these trials. And even those companies that have made investments in technology and virtual capabilities are looking for further guidance on how to extend these investments to meet the future needs. Particularly, I think the areas of data sharing and integration to extract key insights from trial data faster is a huge area of focus. The solutions that exist today might be digital, but many are fragmented, not integrated. And there are a growing number of management and compliance challenges of running increasingly complex programs and trials across new markets and in different languages. Understandably, pharma is seeking smart solutions to these challenges. So as we look across the continuum of virtual capabilities, there are many ways to support sites and patients 
and engage with trial participants digitally. In this diagram, there's three dimensions to consider when assessing virtualization, including burden on the patient, caregiver or site, physical movement of the patient, and support and digital engagement. Today, we're seeing across our customer base, pharma, co co pharma companies pushing the boundaries with patients working to source direct feedback from them on protocols before a trial even starts. And even if a patient clears inclusion and exclusion criteria, the current paradigm makes it very difficult for them to participate unless they're near a research center or site for every visit. Pharma companies industry-wide are looking at how to make their trials more patient-centered. And technology approaches we're seeing get adopted are things like remote monitoring and telehealth. Today, digital endpoints and sensors can also easily capture critical timely information in a home setting and feed this back in real time to clinicians. Virtual trials by their very nature require a closer digital connection to the patient and also require a better understanding of patient needs. And what better way to accomplish this than through a unified platform for patient engagement? Salesforce provides a patient engagement platform that allows sponsors and sites to provide a consistent experience across all of the trial sites while ensuring each patient's preferences are taken into account. Companies can build a persona around the type of patient they want to acquire and enroll in a trial and then advertise to those patients. This essentially provides the ability Ability to find unknown patients and convert them to known patients by providing personalized content. This can really speed recruitment. Then during enrollment, the right content is provided that will resonate with each one of those patients, with lots of education and information provided to them along the way. Patients can be provided with tools and mobile apps to help with appointment scheduling, reminders, medication adherence, and more. And one important aspect is also to measure the success of this type of engagement approach throughout the trial and be able to adjust as necessary. And use of predictive insights are possible to really inform the trial on which patients might be at risk of dropping out or which sites are expected to enroll fastest. Salesforce provides a single global platform to meet your needs no matter where you are in your virtual clinical trial journey. Check out the Salesforce website for more information on our solution and valuable resources. And with that, I'd like it to turn it back over to you, Matt. Thanks, Jennifer. Awesome. Uh, we will uh, launch into our first poll now. Um, and it's, it's a good one to start off with. Um, what stage of technology adoption and clinical trials were you pre-COVID? Um, it's there now. Um, the four options are not started, uh, at the beginning, testing technology in a pilot format, uh, deployed and working with patients with the aim of further adoption across trials, adopted a company-wide approach. Um, I'll, I'll leave that open for a little bit, but uh, Jacob, I'd like to come to you first and then and Celine. Um, I'd like to hear where you guys are. Where are you in this sort of journey or roadmap as it might be? Uh, and, and right now, what are the sort of key strategic goals uh, for its purposes uh, in your companies? So uh, if, I, if I were to take a step back, I'd say, of course, getting to a future paradigm for clinical trials is a, a first and foremost a strategic goal of ours. And for quite some time, we've been exploring this space and creating new approaches, frankly, also with, with, with partners. So uh, we're, we're quite focused on this. Um, I think we've learned a lot. Uh, I think we had some of the, you know, we've rolled out some of the newer kind of paradigms very quickly. And I think now we're looking at how do we scale these approaches across trials, which is, is not an easy um, task whatsoever, right? So 
I think that that's where we're at in our journey. And we, we, when we definitely share back learnings to the community because we think that really the needs to come together and start on to similar infrastructure, similar standards that will allow for, um, for greater uh, scale to, to occur much more quickly. Yeah, and at Admiral, we've we've started our journey at a, at a different time point. At, at, as Novartis, uh, we have formed a digital uh, team of about 15 people about a year ago. Um, so we had time to really onboard and start the journey before COVID hit, uh, which means that we had very good, you know, basics in place at that point. But I think the situation also revealed, you know, the need for a broader ecosystem uh, to be put in place to fully digitalize an end-to-end -end, um, organization like Almoral. Thanks. All right, I am going to end polling now and share the results. You should see those up on your screen. Uh, at the top of the pile was uh, at the beginning, test, testing technology in a pilot format, 38% uh, not started at 28%, uh, deployed technology uh, at 25 uh, and a few leading the way uh, who have adopted a company-wide approach uh, at 10%. Uh, Brian, you obviously work across a few different companies. Does those results surprise you? Uh, what are your thoughts? You're on mute as well. Yeah, <clears throat> I thought you were about to ask uh, where we were, but uh, now <laughs> yep. I think. Take it uh, on at the end if you could, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, what I think. Uh, I only, if I could speak specifically, I haven't seen uh, uh, electronic informed consent and uh, I haven't seen electronic informed consent implemented in all the groups that we work with. Um, and uh, with regards to let's say uh, technology for home visit operations. I haven't seen any of like uh, any uh, contiguous technology there. Um, that's the most, I mean, without, uh, without question, e ECOA and um, uh, ECRF, EDC, CTMS systems, those are all in play. I think that there are certain niches like the informed consent and the home visit operations on the provider side that uh, we've, we've yet to see in the market. Um, I'd say from what I've seen on the procurement side, as it relates to the large pharmaceutical companies, I think uh, the uh, audit process for new technologies, I think, uh, um, I think that with the world we live in now, we really need to rethink how that uh, technology procurement and audit and evaluation process uh, has been done in the past for uh, future purposes. You know, I don't think uh, it's practical in today's world for a small organiz a small organization, say even 100 or even 200 employees to be tasked with um, evaluating uh, Salesforce.com's uh, um, 21 CFR Part 11 compliance and things like that, AWS. So I think, I think that that process has been uh, holding it up. I mean, the, the, the curve, you know, Matt, doesn't surprise me at all. I think if you were to plot out the results if, and you look at that curve, it, it, it very much mirrors like a standard technology adoption curve that you would see. So to me, it's, it, it feels very natural, right? I mean, this is just the journey that the industry is on at, at this point in time. Uh, I'm going to quickly just uh, remind the audience to please keep the questions coming in throughout. Um, I do have one here uh, quickly um, before we launch into some other things. Uh, with clinical trials going virtual, will sponsors even need a site anymore? Uh, I, Celine, I might come to yeah, you. Yeah, sure. I'd love to get your thoughts. 
happy to happy to share. I guess it really depends on the nature of the trial, right? There are some examination that you will not be able to to skip and that will need to be done by a healthcare professional. Um, similarly to some of the procedures, if you imagine that the drug administered is a biologics, um, it's complicated for, for patients to um, self-inject the drug. Um, so so for, for some trials, I do believe that we will be able to get complete virtual trials, completely decentralized with full at-home monitoring and zero site visits. But I do believe that certain conditions and certain, you know, uh, um, measurements taken during those visits will need to continue to happen. I, you know, I was reading uh, something from Science 37 uh, just the other day, which from what I understand is doing uh, quite well um, financially uh, during this time. And uh, they mentioned that phase one studies um, being done virtually, but they don't think uh, that it's an option. Uh, they've publicly stated that uh, they are uh, not interested to run a phase one studies uh, remotely just because of the inherent risks. Um, uh, Emmanuel's question with uh, regards to um, sites going virtual or not using sites, it, de it depends on your definition of a site. It, do you mean brick and mortar locations? If you, need, if you mean brick and mortar locations, you know, uh, procedures such as, uh, let's take a lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, for example, collection of synovial fluid, uh, and uh, let's say an MRI or any sort of a large equipment needs, that's going to have to happen at a center. Uh, location. But if your definition of site means uh, a principal investigator, you know, that, that part I think uh, can be done remotely. Though again, uh, the assessments uh, that there are certain assessments that can only be done uh, in the clinical setting and you may not want to take that risk. Uh, speaking for ourselves, uh, saying when uh, we have done, we have participated in um, sickle cell and uh, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy studies where we've done the, you know, the walk test and so on for uh, pediatric uh, patients. And uh, we, we've done those in the home setting. We've done other sort of tests and uh, uh, assessments at home, but there are certain, as I said, there are certain assessments that have to be done in, uh, at a brick and mortar location with other nursing staff and uh, I think that, that that with the world today, uh, home visits and just virtual trials, the, historically that's been more of a cavalier or uh, risky approach. Now it's more of a risk mitigation strategy, to borrow the words of uh, Craig Lipset. And uh, I think that we're going to continue to see that as we see the, uh, the positive externalities of let's say, uh, higher retention rates, lower drop-off, um, fewer missed appointments, which we all know in healthcare uh, exists and not going anywhere. So um, I, back to the question of trials going virtual, uh, phase one, again, from the top, phase one, I think that, that you know, it's tough to get away from the site. Large operations and surgical procedures and uh, biopsies, obviously, and uh, other uh, invasive procedures, you're going to need an actual brick and mortar location, God forbid, for something that's going wrong. And then uh, for severe adverse events, such as uh, chemo infusions and uh, things like that, radiation therapy, I'm, I find it hard to believe that we'll be doing that at home. But uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, blood draws and you know assessments, you know, of course we can do that remotely. Uh, Jen, Jennifer, obviously you work with a few different companies. Um, when you've seen uh, new people come on board and they begin to engage in some of these processes and these technologies. Where have the roadblocks been? Where have you seen the biggest challenges for these sorts of companies? And, and has there been, do you have any some advice for those beginning, you know, those ones at the lower end we saw on the poll for, um, I guess, beginning this roadmap uh, that we're talking about here today? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that we're really seeing is focusing in earlier on in the process around um, engaging patients to understand their expectations and how to best be supported during the trial. Um, and then using that information to then guide the uh, patient recruitment and enrollment. You know, I think that's a good place to start because the recruitment can be so difficult, um, finding the right patient for the right trial. 
Um, so that's an area that we really see um, pharma focusing on um, because there are solutions in that area to help and because it's something that uh, takes so long and can be very costly. Um, I think the, the points that um, Jacob, uh, Celine, and, and Brian made are spot on in terms of, you know, in terms of adding virtual capabilities, it really depends on the type of trial, um, the therapy, um, and, and the patient cohort. And I think that one thing that um, we're getting asked a lot of questions about is how do you manage um, really a, a, a virtual trial where you do have patients that might have an expectation to want to be seen in person by a clinician? Um, and how do you manage having a diverse patient population and meeting the needs of all those patients in, in that trial? Yeah, that's a good point, actually. And it was lead, going to directly lead into my next question is, we obviously talk about the need for decentralized trials from multiple perspectives, including financial ones, clearly. but uh, Celine and Jacob, I'd be interested, do you often just go out at the start of all this and just say, is this the type of trial that's needed or wanted or do you want to be a part of? Or, or do we, because I sometimes feel like we think this is the best way forward, but do we even take a step back from there and say, is this patient want to take part in a virtual trial? Yeah, so, so, so we do talk to patient association a lot when it comes to uh, designing trials. And depending on the disease, you know, when, when patients uh, manifest some, some um, need to be at home and some reluctance to travel to sites when sometimes the travel is, is very far, uh, takes a few days, you know, you have to come the day before, stay in a hotel, probably take a caregiver with yourself. Uh, patients don't always feel very comfortable depending on, on the disease that they have to do all of this. And they would much rather prefer doing it from the comfort of their living room. Um, and so we do really review protocol synopsis with patient association before we make this type of decisions to make sure that, that we are as patient friendly as possible. Yeah, get it can't be uh, it can't be over <laughs> overemphasized. Um, getting patient input up front is the key to uh, doing anything well. Um, and the reality is, it we're, I see all, often these discussions kind of go off to sort of think about what is the future of clinical trials. The reality is the future of clinical trials is making them seamless in terms of how patients and healthcare providers experience their lives as they would in, in a regular care setting. You know, so uh, the, the, the fact is there's no patients that are the same. Some are gonna want to stay at home, some are gonna wanna go into a site, and you need to be able to make that happen for them is, is, is really the future. Mm -hmm. Using technology, right? Absolutely. I am going to pose another question to our audience now. Uh, where can uh, virtual engagement, engagement have the biggest effect in trials? Uh, increased enrollment, improved rates of detention, retention, uh, more dynamic protocols and uh, novel digital endpoints. Uh, I'll leave that open for a couple of minutes and we'll keep going through uh, some of these things. I will uh, come to the audience now uh, and we'll get a couple of more questions. Um, what are what are some some typical reasons for participant drop off, uh, and how can we see um, these sorts of connected technologies fight that? Well, I, I, maybe, maybe I can get it started. I know that Selena and I were having a conversation, you know, about this uh, when when prepping for the panel. You know, part of it definitely is inclusion exclusion criteria being really disconnected from patient demographics and their wants and concerns about a trial. So the more you can really get feedback uh, when designing a protocol and making sure that, A, first of all, it's important that it answers the question correctly, right, obviously, but that it connects to the patient demographic and their wants and concerns is, is fundamental. So, so many times these things are disconnected. The protocol is overly complex. It's hard to follow. It's hard for the patient to, to manage. 
and that really leads to a lot of, uh, of, of missed opportunities for, for retention. Completely agree. I would say exactly as, as Jacob said, the complexity of the protocol and the burden, burden for patients we've seen have been big hurdles to, to keep patients in the trials. What we've seen uh, on our end is uh, throughout the, so I definitely agree with uh, what Celine and uh, uh, Jacob mentioned, especially for clinical trials and criteria. And that's why, that's why uh, it's over the past few years, it's been more in vogue to uh, engage patient advocacy groups and protocol design and development and so on, and consent. Uh, what we've noticed uh, in addition to that is uh, throughout the studies in order to, because uh, the largest, the translational studies, observational, non-interventional studies are the bulk of uh, the work that we do. And uh, what I can contribute, a knowledge piece, um, a data point from our work is that um, what we've noticed is that we can capture specific data points at specific uh, point at specific uh, time points uh, due to increased patient engagement, even over the phone or via text or via email. Um, so, for example, uh, within our community, over 30,000 patients that we engage with, uh, about 50% uh, <clears throat> are diagnosed with an autoimmune or inflammatory condition, so chronic condition. So. You know flares and uh, you know gluten exposures and things like this. Uh, they will happen uh, time to time. Uh, pain crises with individuals diagnosed with sickle cell, and because of the the way that we've established our model, which is uh, each uh, patient uh, population or each individual participant has a uh, patient advocate that can, that they can call each time they have a flare or a pain crisis or anything like that to report, hey, I'm having this event. Uh, if you would like to draw my blood, uh, you know, I'm available. So we were, because of that direct patient engagement, having a dedicated individual that they can speak to about research, uh, we found that that's uh, increased engagement, um, you know, materially. I mean, we are seeing uh, within those conditions that I just mentioned, we're seeing 90 plus percent retention over a three to four year period of time. Um, and uh, how that's different from the site model. The site model, you have um, you know, the clinicians that actually perform the uh, operations and execute on the protocol, but uh, there isn't an outside party or uh, injective you know, party looking at the study and saying, okay, well, um, this is what you're gonna learn, this is who's gonna use the sample, this is how you're gonna contribute to research. Um, it's only gonna be 100, milliliters so you know eight tablespoons walking them through the study and uh, helping enlighten and uh, elucidate certain aspects of the research uh, I think as a third party I think can be quite powerful um, which is something that's missing from today's uh, brick-and-mortar site model which is based on clinicians and executives uh, uh, clinicians and staff that are performing the study not necessarily communicating the contribution and value Thanks, Brian. I am going to end the polling now and share the results. Uh, they should be up on your screen again. Uh, out front, significantly improved rates of retention, uh, and then uh, all at a similar uh, place around that 17 for novel digital endpoints, 14% uh, for my more dynamic protocols, and 24% uh, for increased enrollment. And I think if I was to pose it to you guys quickly, um, that all would have been uh, your answer or, or at least your thoughts on, on where the audience was going to go. Yeah, I mean, I think for right now, um, I think in the re reality, as we kind of move towards the new future of clinical trials, I think you'll see a lot of improvement on all of these dimensions. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, depending upon the, you know, well, it depends upon the digital solution that you're implementing, but I think you'll see improvement along all those dimensions ultimately. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a, a sorry, Brian, carry on. No, I was just gonna say, uh, um, what we're really excited about here is, um, uh, we haven't, so we haven't launched uh, a mobile app for our patient community yet. Yes, I, I know it's very late, but 30,000 users, which probably have our what, like third version out by now, but um, with uh, the Apple Health Kit and the uh, electronic informed consent there and uh, you know, being able to sign with your, your fingertip and 
uh, being able to pull in uh, records from Epic and your MyChart and so on. Uh, I actually think that that's uh, the biggest uh, wave. Um, the, the enrollment, but also pulling the health data uh, from your site. So I, that bullet wasn't uh, one of the options, but I sincerely believe that uh, taking your file, taking the fire file from the, your my chart or Epic and so on, all the way to the institution actually doing the research, uh, portability of medical data is actually going to be the uh, the biggest thing that we see. Again, and bias. And to me, I think there's also a geographical difference. I think the audience based in the US might have responded slightly differently than the audience based in Europe, I think, because the capabilities are a little different. All right, guys, I have a, a couple of questions here from uh, Fabian Astic uh, around uh, a digital twin of the patient. Uh, do you think that a digital twin of the patient allowing to correlate the effect of the drug to its plasmatic concentration based on the ind individual char 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 characteristics, there we go, of the patient would be useful for phase two to three clinical trials. And if this digital twin uh, comes as an app for the patient, reassuring him and showing him the effect or him aware of the effect on his body, on their body to increase adherence, would it lower the number of patients uh, quitting a trial? Yeah, I mean, so let me, I, I, I'm happy to hop in and kick it off. So I, I'm actually very passionate about this, this area. Um, so, in a way, patientless or humanless types of trials um, are probably some of the most patient-centric approaches you can imagine. So, um, I think digital twins are sort of a phenomenon that's starting to happen across all industries as we get more nuanced data on processes and systems. We can we can emulate them through um, through you know diff different ways, different methodologies, and therefore test things in those models, and not have to try it in the real world. So I think it will. It, it's actually already being done, right? In in some cases, right? You have the virtual control arms that have already been implemented in certain studies. Um, so this is coming, but we need a lot better data to actually model humans uh, off of to get you know more digital twins more widespread the 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 problem of course is the data is not really complete um, and it's very fragmented right right now so as things like uh, what Brian was mentioning as Apple pulls together these health records we might see more of that happen over time yeah, I have to agree with Jacob. I think, you know, it's a trend, it's very emerging, but there are a lot of spaces where we need more data to solidify the use of of something that that, you know, is more at the level of a gadget today because because we don't have all the data supporting, you know, the systematic use of something like that. Uh, I want to touch on um, novel digital endpoints now. Um, can you guys, uh, is you seen specific examples where you've seen this technology um, really have a, a big impact on a, on a study? Um, and, and I'd also be interested to hear, how do you go about deriving a, I guess, a patient-centered digital endpoint? And does it vary from how you might go about that in a site versus a virtual setting? Uh, I, I can't answer the second portion of it, um, but the first point I'd say that uh, <clears throat> Uh, digital endpoints, if uh, your definition of a digital endpoint is uh, information that we can collect um, remotely uh, by using a wearable or anything like that, uh, the answer is that specifically uh, within autoimmune conditions or the you know, what I just mentioned with pain crises or uh, a flare or gluten exposure or anything like this, um, and as well as uh, like the ability to take pictures of swollen joints or anything like that. Uh, and activity such as um, you know walking, as I just mentioned, like a six-minute walk test, um, a level of activity relative to let's say flare events, uh, location uh, of where they traveled and where they were working. For example, uh, gosh, about four years ago, we participated in a study with a, a Mount Sinai um, 
genetic, the genetic environmental microbial study of Crohn's and colitis patients. Uh, and it was a, essentially a study of their um, obviously dietary habits and so on, but also took into consideration where the individuals lived and if that, if the atmosphere, particulates in the atmosphere and the pollution or anything like that actually made a difference in uh, flare events. And so I think uh, that there are multiple, um, uh, multiple conditions in which digital, digital endpoints can be quite valuable, especially in conditions where the pathology at a molecular level has not yet been defined. What do I mean by that? Okay, breast cancer, uh, HER2 positive, you know, EGFR or you know, triple negative breast cancer, we, you know, we know what's going on there. Um, you know, BCR able and Gleevec, you know, Novartis' drug, you know, there, there's certain pathology at a molecular level, which is completely defined. But then when you need more data in conditions such as RA or lupus or Crohn's and colitis, um, digital endpoints could be uh, helpful in, in that assessment. And I'd, I'd say the same thing for patient reported outcomes and surveys. Uh, because again, the, uh, the, at a molecular level, there are certain conditions that are that we are yet to understand. So adding the kind of digital component to the overall data set uh, could be uh, valuable. Yeah, I have to agree with Brian. I, I think there's, you know, for, um, for secondary and exploratory endpoints such as biomarkers or quality of life, there is very good understanding of how to virtual, virtualize those endpoints now. And they, they've been, you know, validated and, and they have been correlation study drawn between, you know, the old fashioned way of doing it and, and the new way of doing it. Where I see more difficulties now is for primary endpoints, the one that give you, you know, an indication and a label. And I see a little bit of resistance um, not necessarily of, of the health authorities to, to let you try it, but somehow the industry doesn't want to fail. So, so I feel that, you know, the industry as a, as a whole need to take risks. Uh, and I have a very strong example. We were working in Alzheimer's disease a few years back. You know, and for Alzheimer's disease patients, it was very complicated to travel to sites, you know, take a caregivers with them and then have to do this, this shopping list test where they give you um, 20 words and, and then distract you for half an hour and then ask you to repeat those words. And you haven't slept in your bed. You haven't had your coffee that day. So do you really measure cognition or do you measure the anxiety of the person not being, you know, at home? And so having very open discussion with the health authorities around topics like that they were like well absolutely you can digitalize this old-fashioned pen and paper test and have them look at the list on their ipad in their living room with their usual cup of coffee and then have the list disappear and 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 reappear you know 20 or 30 minutes later um and and so you know i think that we have to do more of those hard endpoint digitalization, as we said earlier, also for the comfort of patients and making sure that we are not drawing false negative because we're introducing so much variability in the patient's environment that you, you don't even know what you're measuring at the end of the day. Uh, I will quickly ask a question and I, I don't know too much about it, so I'll hopefully get some answers here. Uh, are the regulations fit for purpose for those sorts of things that we're trying to, what we're talking about today as we move forward? Uh, are there changes that need to be? Are they being implemented? Are there conversations happening? So are, are the regulations fit for purpose? Uh, mm -hmm. It might be a slightly loaded question, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not gonna answer that one. My marketing team's um, coming. Look, so. I, I, I think like the, the, the whole community, um, you know, industry, uh, healthcare providers, sites, regulators, payers are, are all on this journey, I think. You know, I think it's probably um, hard to expect that the regulations are completely uh, right to invite all of this innovation to happen, but the conversations are happening, right? And I think we've got to get better at working together as a community to push on things faster because, you know, at least in the US, um, I wouldn't actually say that the FDA has been a, a big hurdle in a lot of instances to, to, to try things. Um, 
can we get better at codifying uh, um, codifying guidances and things like that? Yes, um, but I think it's going to require kind of the, the the entire community coming together and working a little bit more fluidly together. Mm -hmm. And Europe is a little behind on that topic. I think the U.S. is more advanced. All right, thanks guys. I didn't realize I was asking a loaded question. I should check that one beforehand <laughs> next time. Uh, I'm gonna come to a, another poll now to the audience. Um, so we've talked about a few different technologies sort of in a broad umbrella today, um, but here we go here, be a bit more specific. What technology will have the biggest effect on virtual engagement and trials? Wearables, telehealth, mobile apps, social engagement platforms, or they all need to be used to conjunction for it to work best. Uh, I'm going to let that one sit for a while. Um, we've talked a lot about sort of the external processes today uh, or so far, um, but I'd like to sort of shift into the internal stuff. And Jacob, you're obviously uh, the co-founder of what the Biome and Celine, you're part of this new team at El Morel in Barcelona. The things that we're talking about, they're not necessarily new, they're not groundbreaking, but we're we're putting a bit more pressure on ourselves and as an industry to engage and to implement them. How do you advise your internal and external stakeholders on the key advantages and, and how do you get that buy-in from everybody so that we can actually, you know, do this thing? So, so I think the key for me and the reason, frankly, why the biome was founded was based off of my experiences in global drug development. The key is we've got to get better at doing rapid create, test, and learn cycles internally and not making a big bet that this is exactly how the future is going to be and this is exactly with whom we're going to create that future. That we've got to be able to fluidly co-create with a bunch of di uh, different partners externally. And as a result, we have to get better uh, with how we do that, frankly, as Novartis. And that's the philosophy upon which the biome was founded. So as we kind of get better at doing these rapid create test and learn cycles and really generating evidence behind certain digital models within clinical trials, we can make better informed decisions about where to double down or where to kind of, you know, uh, not double down, frankly. I mean, it's, it's exactly like discovering medicines. No one can pick the winner in, you know, in a, in a medicine. That's why we need to do clinical trials. And I think similarly, no one can say this is exactly how the future is going and this is exactly who's who's building the new future and therefore as a result we need to get better at working together uh to co-create that future do you think that that's been a bit of a hurdle as we've always just been trying to predict the long-term future and that we can you just get stuck in that well i i mean personally i, I you know, I think a lot of teams have been forced to pick the winner because a lot of their internal processes don't allow them to rapidly create, test, and learn with external partners. So a lot, a lot of the business processes, like procurement, legal, and um, you know, uh, checks and everything like that, you know, because they're so protracted in some instances, uh, more or less teams are forced to pick a winner right now, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to change in the Novartis biome is to allow teams to rapidly create tests and learn with their partners and really then generate evidence to figure out what the right you know model looks like the thing the thing that i'm seeing matt is there's a bit also of a fragmentation of employing some of these technologies and approaches um, and i think it needs to be thought about a little more holistically um, so it's like let's try this, let's try that, let's, let's try this. And that provides still yet a disconnected experience for the patient. Um, and I think that's an area where I think folks really need to, to lean on improving. And yeah. to Jacob's point, I think um, there's a lot that needs to be done across the industry, um, not just in, in pharma, to really improve um, the way we, we run these trials to make them more effective and faster. And it's through things like um, co-creation with technology and then working with healthcare systems and others. Yeah, and, and I just wanna underscore something that, uh, that Jennifer said, it, it's completely on point. We've gotta get a lot better at working as a community and not just you know, individual pharma companies and, or companies, even individual companies coming together, 
but working with those healthcare systems and working with payers to kind of create more shared, you know, standards and everything like that to re reduce these fragmented efforts, um, I think is going to be so important to scaling these new future paradigms. So I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I do too. I, I think for me, the key is really to create those ecosystems that are, you know, flexible and, and, and really uh, serve the purpose because as Jacob described, you know, drug development is not a perfect process, although it's a very highly codified process, uh, we still end up with, with, um, with issues to solve and and digital has been able to solve quite a number of those issues so um so again testing you know evolving the ecosystem on a regular basis as we learn from it and making sure that we keep on serving the patient that's that's completely the approach uh, i agree with everything that's been said and uh, the other uh, the other aspect that i'll add is uh, um, I think that there are many uh, small companies in early stage, like startup companies that say, you know, I can do X, I can do just Y really well, which is fantastic. The problem is that these uh, that trials obviously require, um, you know, rap, you know, large scale. So even with uh, conversations that we're having uh, with regards to performing home visits, the big question is, fantastic, you can do the US home visits, great. Well, how about Europe, how about APAC, how about, and so all those different, uh, I think that companies will either have to partner, as Jacob mentioned, or they'll have to subcontract. The problem with subcontracting is that quality and medical liability and oversight uh, disappears, if you will, at that, at that level, so that's a concern. So, um, yeah, the, I think the funding from an entrepreneurial level will have to increase, and, I think there will be consolidation in the space in order to meet the needs of uh, clients to provide a more of a holistic approach. Um, there are companies out there um, that, for example, don't have their own uh, you know, phlebotomy forces, but have you know a virtual trial platform. So they have the technology, they have the PIs, but the actual folks that do the home visits aren't. Uh, you know, contract with the organization. And then that disconnect from a regulatory insurance and liability perspective starts creating questions. And then, you know, the sponsor, which has worked very diligently in identifying potential solutions, is now uh, concerned about these risks where, you know, you know, I wouldn't want to be a sponsor right now evaluating vendors. It's, it's not easy. If I'm going to be on the compliance and regulatory aspects, it's the business risk. And, uh, the uh, continuity across you know multiple different vendors i mean that's why uh, the cro business is you know, still in existence i'm going to quickly come to our last poll results here team and uh, i think it's to jennifer's question uh, jennifer's, jennifer's point about being holistic uh, there was really only one answer and i'm glad you all picked it well for the majority uh, they all need to be used in conjunction for it to work best and that's as you said jennifer we we do need to be thinking in a holistic fashion. Uh, I am going to quickly come to our last poll question while we, we have five minutes left and I wanna get a couple more questions in. Uh, so I'm gonna go to this last poll and leave it open and we'll finish on it. Um, we all think there's probably gonna be a little bit of a reversion once we come out of this. So uh, that's where the question is. Uh, how far do you think you'll revert away from virtual engagement technology post COVID-19? Uh, we hadn't started adoption, so can't revert. Back to square one, a small reversion, but with long-term goals still to move to virtual trial models. We won't revert, it's full steam ahead. Um, these, these models as far as long as the as well as the traditional model they can be time consuming and to put this all together it can be financially burdensome does it require an economy of scale to be successful uh, or does it do we just need to continue on the way that we are um, how do you sort of enable all of it when it comes to the variance in trial protocols I mean, from my perspective, uh, I think that one thing that you need to think about is an approach where there is capabilities that are required across um, all sites um, and meet the needs, the, the basic needs across regions. 
and then build on top of that. Um, I think that's an, an approach to sort of how to get started and how, and how to think about it, um, particularly taking into account um, regional or, or ge geographic differences. But I don't think that um, companies should let that get in the way of uh, progressing the way that they approach um, virtual clinical trials. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll just <laughs> throw out some 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 thoughts here. It's because it, it's interesting to ponder, right? How will this whole thing unfold? Because we know we all need to get to scale, and you know, bringing these more future paradigms to to you know out, out into the the community. Um, so, how will that happen? Um, we know we need to get more standards in place, and so may, and we just recognize that we need to start you know using these technologies in combination. Uh, yet any individual uh, clinical trial team is not really well prepared right now to, you know, knit all these things together de novo for their particular trial. So how do you think about almost like an app store like approach where they can literally pick and choose based on their needs? And if there is an app store that would suggest a certain community it would suggest ultimately that there will be standards put into place based on the popularity of the apps. And that's where you know, we might get to scale ultimately. Um, the other approach is we just come together as a community now and start building things in a standard fashion, which um, as much as I'd like to see, that you could see, you could understand how there might be challenges with that. So I don't know. Yeah, I think, Jacob, your point about the App Store is sort of similar to um, what I had said, which is I think that there needs to be um, a pick and choose what's required, knowing that um, there's a certain standard set of capabilities that everybody will need and use. I think the, um, the data standards interoperability, it's a big one. Um, but that crosses every aspect of, I think, healthcare and life sciences in terms of drug development all the way to, to, to trials and drug launch. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing more progress in that area as well, because I think that's going to continue to change the game for how um, companies like uh, Novartis, Sanguin, and others bring um, drugs to market. Awesome. Thanks, guys. We will come to the poll results now. Uh, and at the uh, at forty seven percent, a small reversion, but with the long term goal uh, still to move towards a virtual trial model. Uh, at thirty three percent, we won't revert. It's full steam ahead. That's positive to see. Um, back to square one, only at four percent. Uh, and at 17%, we hadn't started adoption, so can't revert. I think positive to see uh, at the top end there, people still looking to make uh, that move long term. Uh, we are just about out of time, everyone. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience, uh, people who are looking to start on this road, roadmap or finish it to go to that full scale adoption? Uh, what would you say to them? I'd say uh, uh, now that if you are switching or investing in uh, technology or virtual trial technology, uh, make sure that you're um, capturing a performance data and uh, ROI data so that once, you know, if uh, your leadership or your team decides, okay, we should move away from virtual trials, then um, you, you can at least provide the, the data showing, okay, compared to other studies uh, in the past, this is, uh, you know, this is the information that we were able to get. And this is the ROI that we were, you know, that we should look at if we're going to go back. So um, you don't use this uh, time as an exercise as um, a good way to do good time to do AB testing for the future. Yeah, and I would say the important thing is to hopefully move away from the con from the the uh, word virtual in trials and understand that there's different archetypes of future you know trial paradigms that you need to design the trial with the right technology that's fit for purpose for your study. So it's not just about going sightless or that's not what this is about. It's about using the right technology to achieve your objective. 
things. Um, so that's very important. And really thinking about what those archetypes are. Yeah, and I would say prioritize on, you know, a, a couple of, of uh, top priorities that you have for your company and find the right solution for the right trials and for the right group of patients. Uh, that's an expression that Jennifer used earlier, and this is very, very true. Tina, for any last thoughts? Yeah, I think I would just second um, what everybody said, which I think is um, think about how to get started. Recognize that you know you don't need to do it all at once, um, but have a plan and a roadmap for an approach that is somewhat plug and play, depending upon the trial type, the patients, um, and the regional or geographic differences. Awesome. Well, I'd like to thank you all once again, uh, our panelists first off for their thoughts, uh, and then secondly to our audience for joining us. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I appreciate you joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon or day as it would be. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.